Hey, and welcome back everyone to our hacking streams here, uh, where we are currently looking into the logo fail vulnerability, which is affecting a lot of devices based on UEFI firmware. So um, what you actually just saw there uh, was a custom logo that I put on the laptop that we have here that we're working with, which is a ThinkPad X270. And well, Last time, well, we played around a bit, uh, with, you know, with a USB drive and I put some file systems on it and, you know, played a bit with the uh, partition table and the hex editor and so on. Well, and to be fair, we got a bit lost in the end. So, um, yeah, it, I, I think that wasn't a really a successful path for us. So, yeah, you, you know, you would need to play a bit uh, more with a few other options there. Like, you know, we, we actually looked at the... Uh, format of the partition table and so on, but yeah, whatever. I discarded the approach now and instead, well, I started looking into, well, the actual issue we uh, wanted to discuss here. And that leads us back to the slides that uh, Binary presented uh, at Black Hat this uh, month. So just a few weeks ago at Black Hat Europe, you know, they uh, talked about this issue here and presented their findings, what their strategy was, you know, who is affected and so on. So yeah, um, with that in mind, uh, well, let's actually first now talk about how I actually got my uh, own custom uh, image on this laptop now, which well, is actually just the logo file logo. Uh, you might just have recognized it. Anyway, so um, I, I figured something out, right? So uh, we at some point looked at the uh, downloads that you can find on the Lenovo website, you know, for updating your firmware. So we, you know, found this here. Um, there are utilities, bootable CDs, and so on for the Windows operating system. But yeah, uh, there is actually a bunch more in the downloads that you can find here. So um, let's scroll down a bit here uh, because this is uh, you know where we actually got the file from that we also extracted uh, at some other point. So th there are these downloads here with uh, different versions like version 148, for example, of the UEFI firmware here. Uh, you know, there are downloads for Windows, this utility, the exe file, and then there is a bootable uh, CD that you can burn, which is, uh, you know, based on this ISO file, but you could also convert that and, you know, put that uh, on a USB drive if you so want it. Um, that's actually what some clever people did. So, you know, I looked around a bit and I, I found something uh, that some people did. So uh, I want to first show you this here. Uh, there is somebody who actually rewrote the uh, or uh, wrote a, a custom tool for you know setting a logo and let me quickly zoom in here so uh, this tool here uh, also is made for Lenovo ThinkPads like you know customize the Lenovo PC boot logo or screen without installing you know their own PC manager tool whatever that is I haven't heard of that anyway um, they say they support these and these models here well they are just the ones verified to be working you know, and, and there is a bit of an FAQ. Well, apparently the code isn't too nice and so on. That's what they're admitting here. But nevertheless, uh, I had a quick look and this here apparently is written in C sharp. So the files are ending in .cs. And, you know, when you look closely at it, they actually call into this DLL file here called AI tool API.dll. So yeah, anyway, all of that is, uh, you know, made for Windows and so on. I didn't really work with Windows. So yeah, it's not too interesting for me right now. And well, if we wanted to, um, you know, get an idea of how that works, we might actually want to look into that DLL file. Um, and yeah, of course, uh, that isn't the only option. So you could also use the Novos tools directly and so on. But again, they are just made for Windows. Um, so I looked a bit further. I found this interesting blog article here uh, by somebody calling themselves dead bay B E A B A E D whatever uh, broke my bat now it's dead uh, a bit of a fun thing anyway so they wrote how to put a custom boot logo on a ThinkPad well with a bit of a disclaimer you know uh, bricks are new and so on um, an introduction uh, you know this is what it's usually looking like so we also saw that when we booted up that laptop here um, and down there uh, you know they say this is what you would need uh, they're using a USB flash drive here. Uh, an image, uh, you could use uh, GIF, BMP, you could use JPEG, you know, um, GIF or GIF or whatever you want to call it works uh, best for them. Um, but yeah, I 
I've actually played around with it a bit. Um, so for me, you know, a, a fairly compressed JPEG just worked fine. Uh, BMP is always a bit uh, harder to work with because it's, you know, uh, not such a compact format, right? So there is no compression in a BMP file. It's literally just byte after byte. So yeah, it gets uh, quite large fairly easily. And, you know, when, when I played around, I figured that um, the Lenovo firmware actually, uh, you know, wouldn't accept larger BMPs. Like I could only write, you know, somewhat small ones, like 120 by 120 pixels. And we will look at that in a bit anyway. So yeah, um, they're saying you, you would need to get that update. So we looked at the update page there, right? So uh, they're saying you should get the bootable CD from this BIOS UFI section, which is, you know, what we find here. I just zoomed in a bit. So that would be here. Um, but we're going to choose a bit of a different path. Nevertheless, um, what they're doing here is, you know, they convert the ISO file, you know, to uh, some image that you can then write uh, to a USB drive using the get El Torito tool. Um, you now that, that is something to work with like ISO files and so on. Uh, and they would flash the image on the USB drive and then, you know, by convention, create a specific file. Uh, they are offering some for download here. Uh, you might recognize some of them like the ThinkPad logo or Tux, the uh, Linux mascot and so on. And they're saying, well, uh, you should name the file logo1.jpg or logo2.jpg, whatever. Uh, it, it's it's a bit weird. And, um, you know, those are only conventions, I guess, used by the Lenovo tools. Um, yeah, anyway, so we're going to choose a bit of a different path because I figured something out. And uh, let's have a, a quick look at this here now. So, yeah, I uh, already, uh, you know, took some notes and so on. Um, but um, yeah, what I want to show you is this here. So we, we downloaded the uh, one of the updates, right? And we put that in, uh, actually I tidied up things a bit. I have that uh, firmware directory now or just FW where I have the um, you know extracted download that we have. This is one uh, version that we just downloaded, 137, you know, from like last week. So let's have a look at that again, uh, the version one and so on download. So we had this exe file, right? We extracted that with the inner extract tool and that uh, left us with the app directory here, which contains a bunch of files. And well, we looked at this file here, which is called bioslogo.txt. We had a look at that and it says, well, um, you know, this is how you can, uh, you know, customize your logo if you so want it. You just need to call it specific things. Again, you know, just conventions and so on. So now let's look a bit closer again at all those files and we will notice two things. So the interesting files we're looking for are the EFI files. There is that one here, boot x64.efi. Uh, that is Lenovo's like, you know, sort of uh, management utility, which you can use for, you know, upgrading your firmware, doing some checks and all of that. And then I found this here, shellflash.efi. And I wonder what that actually is, right? So. Well, no, what I just did was uh, first I tried the Lenovo tool. I put that on my USB drive, you know, as the by convention, just boot x64.efi name in the ESP directory in the uh, or in its uh, boot subdirectory, right? So that is how it works. And that would just start. Um, well, and that, you know, just gave me some something I couldn't really uh, work with to do anything with the logo. So I tried this here. I also put that as my boot x64.efi file. Um, but you know, I just saw something flashing very, very quickly and it was gone again. And I, you know, uh, you know, I noticed when I tried it again, I was just seeing some error message and the error was because it was missing some arguments. So I figured, Hey, hang on. This is actually something, um, that is supposed to be run from a UEFI shell. So, uh, I went and downloaded a UEFI shell and we will look at the process of creating a USB drive now. Uh, you know, which has the UFI shell and so on. And with that, uh, we have another website to look at, uh, which is this year at uh, wiki.osdev.org. Also a very nice resource if you do operating systems development, definitely check that out. And they document how the EFI system partition works. And well, I just scrolled down to the important section here, uh, which is this year, the important files on the ESP, the EFI system partition. Um, 
first of all, there, there is this here, which looks a bit like, you know, you might know this from like DOS or Windows, uh, where, you know, you, you would have your drives and then you would have, usually on, on Windows or uh, DOS, you would have a single character, then a colon, backslash, and so on. So you would have that like, you know, back in the days when we had floppy disks, you would have a colon, backslash, and that would be, you know, like the root directory, if you will, of your floppy. Uh, that would be for uh, disks, you would have like C colon backslash and so on. Well, and if you had a second floppy drive, you would have like B colon backslash, you know, stuff like that. So that is a bit similar here. Um, you know, that is also something I actually had to learn again for working with the EFI shell. And so they have these files here. So this here is the one that we already, uh, you know, used now. So that is what I also used for uh, getting us to boot a Linux kernel. So you can just build a Linux kernel with a EFI stop option and, you know, put it at that point in this directory. That will just, you know, start up. Um, yeah, this is not important for us. So this is for the 32-bit uh, systems, but yeah, we're on a 64-bit one. Um, then there is this one here. You can apparently add another boot manager by just calling it boot manager EFI and not put it in a subdirectory. And you can also have a custom startup script. You just call it startup.nsh. I don't know what the N is for. I guess SH is like for, you know, shell. And they're even writing. It's it's similar to a, an MS-DOS batch file. So, you know, back in the days in uh, in DOS, there was this auto .bat, which was like a startup script, essentially. Anyway, so all of this here um, is uh, very helpful for us because now we can play around with that, right? So we can create USB drives and it's, it's really not that hard. We just need to put some files in the right locations. And yeah, so as I, I was saying, I already did that, but now the question is, where did I get the UFI shell from? So let me uh, just reveal the secret. I just did a Google search, right? So <laughs> um, I, I found this here, and these here are my notes. Uh, there is a project on GitHub uh, by P. Batard, and that is just called UFI shell. And what they're doing is, they're just making regular builds of an EFI shell, and then, you know, they prepa uh, prepare these um, ISO files here. So there are two variants, the debug and release version. And, you know, in both cases, you get a very, very small ISO file. So you see this here, you know, it's a mere five point something megabytes. So what I did was I downloaded the release file. And because I only wanted the shell, I didn't want the ISO, I extracted it, right? So uh, I, I use the ISO info tool. You can uh, do that for extraction. Uh, you know, you just say dash I, give it the input file. So that was the release ISO, then dash X for extraction. For whatever reason, you know, these um, like these ISO files are, are a bit weird. I, I didn't really grasp that, to be honest. So, uh, you know, you give the path, but there is also this, like semicolon one. I don't know why. Anyway, so yeah, I could just redirect that uh, to a file. So I just call it boot x64.efi, you know, and put it on the ESP as usual. Like that's sort of what we did with the Linux kernel. Um, now, the second thing I already told you that uh, we're getting the vendor tool, right? So we use inner extract and now we take this shell flash.efi file and we also put it on the ESP, right? So. I just put a copy on the root directory so that I don't need to traverse the directories and that's it. Now, when I start up and I run into an EFI shell, um, first up, you know, we, we actually need to actively type FS0 colon first once because otherwise it tells you like, hey, you're like nowhere. You, you know, can't like do LS or something like that. That's a bit of a weird thing, but yeah, whatever. We need to do it once. Um, if we wanted to, you know, go into some other directory, we can't just cd efi slash boot like, you know, on a Unix X system. Apparently, I had to go into a steps, or at least I couldn't figure it out otherwise. You know, it's like when you say ls efi slash boot, you know, you would just see the files in efi and so on. Th those are really just, you know, my discoveries here. I'm really not a efi person. I don't know much about it. So, yeah, I just found that a bit weird. Anyway, so I tried this tool, right? Shell flash EFI. First, I didn't really figure out, you know, how to invoke it properly. So yeah, I, I had to read the error message in order to say uh, dash help. It's not dash dash help. That won't work. Dash H won't work either, right? So yeah, with a bit of fiddling, I uh, figured out that you would actually just run this here. You would run shell flash EFI 
dash logo, the path to your logo, and then very important, you also need to say dash patch. Uh, that will do the following. It will take your logo, like the file that you provide, um, then it will uh, put that in, in your flash part on the main board, and you know, then on success, it would just uh, persist it and reboot the machine, and lo and behold, you would see your new logo. So yeah, this is the output that you would get. If uh, there isn't enough space, you would get this error message here. So yeah, I you know just scaled down my image again. Um, yeah, I think I went with like 400 by 400 and that worked fine. That was the JPEG that you just saw here uh, when the stream started. So yeah, um, it's persisted in something called the EVSA region. Uh, I, I think it's like a you know storage region in uh, EFI. It's probably EFI is something storage something or you know whatever. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, we would need to read that up. Um, so I saw that contains the logo, but there is also a Windows license key in there for whatever reason. I don't know. Um, well, and then this here is uh, what we're going to get to in a bit. So yeah, um, that is already very nice. So now we have a logo and the logo is then, you know, on startup being parsed and is being shown. And we already figured that there is something, um, you know, which is called system image decoder Dixie. So that is the driver doing the decoding and so on. And well, we can just extract that as well. So from the firmware dump that we took, you know, we can use the uh, a tool called UTK. So I just ran UTK fw.bin extract and then, you know, I can give it a path to where all the files should be extracted. I think we also support extracting a single file, but I, I wasn't really sure about the command, but yeah, whatever, didn't really matter. So what I did was I searched for the GUID that we found last time for the system image decoder Dixie. Um, you know, then I found that file and I copied it over. Uh, this uh, file, I just call it something .bin. So what I noticed was the first four bytes are actually something like, I don't know, it could be like a size or a checksum or, you know, whatever. Um, anyway, so I dropped those four bytes by using the DD tool, you know, choosing a block size of four and, you know, skipping the first block. And then the output here is now this uh, DXE file. And, you know, when I ran the file command on that, I finally got like, oh, this is a PE32 file. So that was indeed what I was looking for. So now how do we get to understand how that image parser works? Um, you know, with that, let's have a quick look again at uh, binary slides because, you know, they actually also uh, did quite of a write up on that. So yeah, let's now quickly walk through the slides and, you know, figure out what we actually need to do here. So, you know, they wrote a bit about the team. This is Fabio, I think, uh, the one who, uh, you know, did a bunch of that research, uh, maybe the main one. I, I don't know, I haven't really seen the talk, so yeah, I don't know what they said here. Uh, this is the rest of the team, right? And so, yeah, they also have some references, like, you know, if you want to look at the, uh, they, they did a, a, a small video uh, where, you know, they're a bit reflecting on the issue. Um, this is the blog post, so that is also what we uh, looked at briefly last time. I also have it open here. Uh, we might have a look again later. Uh, and then uh, they talk about the like attack vectors and so on. So we already looked at that a bit. Um, Alex Matrosov has talked about this before, right? Like this stuff here. Um, well, they also say, well, a bunch of vendors actually have firmware image parsers. So, you know, um, that is actually a dangerous thing maybe. Uh, why, why is that even necessary? I mean, it's it's actually quite nice, right? So I personally find that very okay and acceptable. Um, the issue is just that, uh, you know, you can provide your own images and attackers can as well. So that gets a bit dangerous here now. So yeah, um, the issue isn't really new. Uh, you know, we also briefly talked about that. This is from 15 years ago. Uh, Rafa Wojciuk had already found that uh, and Alexander Tereshkin that was in... Uh, 2009, so yeah, 14 years ago, and uh, well, so now 15 years later, you know, we now have a bunch of different image parsers, they support different formats, and they're running in the DXE phase of that UEFI boot process. We looked at that, right? So yeah, um, they, they found like essentially uh, a, a bunch of software in the ecosystem being vulnerable, like the three major providers uh, that, you know, create firmware frameworks like AMI, Insight, and Phoenix, and then the EDK2 uh, reference code, you know, which is actually also consumed by them. So essentially um, what this is telling us, so first up, uh, this affects like, you know, virtually tons of platforms. Um, 
but it's also fairly portable because those frameworks are also used on other architectures than x86, namely ARM as uh, in their example. You know, and it might be used in other places as well at some point. We'll have to see. So yeah, um, they had an embargo. Uh, that one here was uh, more than 150 days uh, for whatever reason. And that was lifted when they gave the presentation. So, you know, that was uh, coordinated. Um, yeah, they were talking about the implications and, you know, no one is sure if this is, has actually ever been exploited. So, yeah, but, uh, you know, it's good to fix these issues, especially if they're you know, that large scale. Um, so yeah, now let's talk about, about the attack surface again. So we want to look at the image parser and the image parser is, you know, uh, as, I, as I said, everybody has their own one. So inside uh, has their own, um, AMI has their own. And uh, what we are working with is that one here by Phoenix, right? System Image Decoder Dixie. So that is the one I already extracted. Uh, the Tiana Core reference code, you know, has this file here. And I, I guess that was also just uh, fixed to, you know, mitigate the issue. So yeah, if you use an auto release of OVMF, the open virtual machine firmware image, you might actually be able to exploit that issue still, um, you know, with an auto release, uh, or, you know, maybe you just build your own at some point. You can actually go back some commits, right? So you, you can play around with that as well. Anyway, uh, but you know, we got an actual laptop for it. So yeah, let's see. Um, they're looking at the uh, code now. So now the question is, how do we actually get the code to, you know, a binary that we just extracted? So what they did was they created a tool and, you know, they've actually been using it for uh, a bunch of years now. I think it's like two or more years old now. It's called EFI Explorer, which is an extension for uh, the IDA Pro disassembler. And, you know, uh, what, what you can do with it is you get a bunch of these, um, like, annotations and some names and so on. Like in UEFI or in, in EFI, you have like these protocols, you have certain conventions and so on. So, you know, this is uh, what they gear their tool around. Um, so yeah, this is uh, reverse engineering now. I personally don't use IDA Pro. I've never really uh, tried it to be honest. Uh, but yeah, I did something uh, with another tool, uh, which has been released by NSA some years back. Uh, you might uh, know it already. It's called Ghidra. And so, yeah, what I did was I uh, took that um, password file, so our Dixie file, and I loaded that into Ghidra. So that is what we're looking at here now. So let's uh, have a quick look at that. Um, so first of all, let, let's scroll up here and, and see how this works, right? So what you see up here is essentially, um, you know, the header to the file. So yeah, this is literally where it starts. So there are some things like this year, X data, for example, you know, that there is some data in it. Um, then there is like uh, this section here. Uh, this is the module entry point, and then it continues. So there is some reference to something called system table in uh, UFI. They also abbreviate it usually with GST. I think G is for global, and then the uppercase S and T is for a system table, um, and so on. Anyway, so yeah, I, you know, looked at that a bit and uh, I used, uh, well, an extension also for Ghidra to, you know, make a bit more sense of everything. Um, so that is also how I got uh, a bunch of these uh, references. So let me quickly show that to you as well. Um, so Alex T. James here created something called Ghidra Firmware Utils and apparently is still working on it a bit. So there is uh, this commit here from two months ago, uh, which, you know, got a bit of an update. The GUID database, so you know, at UFI everything is essentially um, declared by you know using GUIDs, and then those represent uh, you know like specific files or protocols or whatever. So yeah, this here is um, some some extension. You can also build that from source, or you can just you know download the release version from here. That is what I did. Then I just had to figure out how to actually install that. So I looked at the uh, Ghidra website itself, Ghidra-SRE.org. I think that is for like software reverse engineering or something. And, you know, I scroll to the extension section where, you know, they explain how to install it. Um, yeah, you can even, uh, as it seems, you can also integrate that with IDA Pro or, you know, the Eclipse ID or something, whatever. So yeah, what I did was, um, you know, I just installed the extension, uh, yeah, using the Ghidra thing here. Um, there is like some more notes on that down here. So yeah, there is this menu file, install extensions and so on. 
anyway so yeah now you have a rough idea i will put all of those references as usual in uh in the notes later when uh you know when i create the recording and re-upload it uh there is another extension i found which is this year uh ghidra efi bytecode processor which is for uh you know a bytecode which is like you know think of like the java bytecode for example or uh, nowadays we have web assembly and you know stuff like that it's sort of its its own language, if you will. So there is like an interpreter in UFI, but that is actually not important to us here because the code we're currently dealing with is essentially just x86 code. So yeah, let's um, let's uh, go back into Ghidra again. So we got this here. Um, I just saw this here being the entry point. And then, you know, I, I just scrolled a bit further and I started uh, disassembling. So there is just a, a keyboard shortcut. You can just press D here or, you know, right click and so on. And then, you know, it will give you these options here. Um, so I started looking at that function here and that function was actually very revealing. So there are a few references to data sections uh, this year and that one here. So yeah, I just followed these, um, uh, these references. So I came down here and I found these strings, which are like JFIF, there is uh, GIF or GIF 89A, 87A. Then there is this year BM. You know, so that told me like, hey, hang on, these are the, um, you know, uh, these are the strings uh, that they use to identify an image format. So what essentially happens is when you flash your own image, uh, like, you know, bitmap file or JPEG or whatever, uh, using that vendor tool, it doesn't actually save like metadata separately or something, you know, it just takes that file and then just you know, writes it into the spy flash. So there is no more file extension or anything like that, right? So there, there is actually just the file and its content cell, uh, themselves. So yeah, you would now need to look at that here in order to make sense of the file. So what do you see this here? This uh, first function in that file is really just, you know, looking through it and then, you know, checks, is it a JPEG file? Is it a GIF file or whatever? Or is it a bitmap file? And now the question is, uh, what what kind of file should we actually use, right? So, uh, you know, I looked a bit at JPEG, I looked a bit at GIF, uh, well, just for a brief second, uh, then I fell through and looked at this here. Uh, well, and, uh, a friend of mine here actually from the hackerspace then said, hey, what are you actually really, uh, you know, playing with? What, what are you trying and so on? Uh, because I hadn't really read up on everything yet. So I had another look at those slides here. So. Um, you know, they're, they're writing about the attack surface, yada, yada. Uh, they wrote about their fuzzing attempts and so on, like, you know, how they really started to um, see if there are actually issues in those parsers, you know, like which branches would you need to take and so on. Um, well, apparently because they are just uh, PE files, you know, like Windows executables, essentially, uh, it wasn't too hard for them to create, you know, an environment where they could fuzz those binaries. Um, yeah, they wrote a bit about that, finding lots of issues and so on. And now this table here is the interesting one. And now we need to remember, hey, what vendor was our firmware created by? So there are those three candidates inside AMI and Phoenix. So our firmware is actually made by Phoenix and they found, um, well, two memory corruption issues, one in the BMP parser and one in the GIF parser. The BMP one, could apparently trigger a heap-based buffer overflow. So, you know, that means you, you could just write into memory locations where you're not supposed to write into. And, you know, with some constraints maybe and so on. Um, or, uh, you know, this one here, you, you could read outside of, you know, the memory that you would actually <laughs> only be able to look at. So, yeah, those are very uh, strong vulnerabilities. Uh, this here is actually the, you know, worst one. When you get a buffer overflow, you're very close to code execution. So yeah, they um, wrote a bit more about that. And they said, hey, by uh, choosing, you know, a specific pixel height or pixel width, um, you know, you might actually be able to trigger something. So yeah, let's actually have a look at the uh, bitmap parser here, right? So uh, that is here in the function list. So, you know, I did some annotations here. So yeah, that wasn't uh, provided by Ghidra itself. But, you know, I just looked at everything. So wh when I saw which file type here is uh, recognized how and so on, I called the functions, uh, you know, accordingly. So 
yeah, when it's uh, when it's doing this match here, like you know, some some variable. This is like you know they're like uh, going through the bytes, and then at some point they're saying, hey, if you know you get a match with the uh, BM thing here, like a B and an M, um, then you know uh, it would actually be uh, this here, like image type three, right? So when we get image type three. Um, that would mean uh, we parse a GIF. Oh no, I, I oh no, I looked at something wrong. Sorry, uh, in in this branch here. So we're here, and then it would set it to one. Sorry. So image type is uh, what I called that variable. Uh, now it's set to one, and one means it's a bitmap. So it's going to call the parse bitmap function. Now we look at the bitmap parser a bit. Uh, you see this function here is also, you know. Still quite comprehensible, but also, you know, still a bit of a mouthful. Uh, there are other functions being called here. Um, and yeah, nevertheless, let's uh, quickly walk through here. So all of these here are just uh, variables being used locally mostly. And uh, well, then then I saw this here. So they, they are doing this comparison. I think they're checking if the header is actually large enough. So they're saying like if something is less than hex 37, uh, but it could also be something else. I'm, I'm not too sure. I, I think at position number two is actually the uh, header size. So yeah, uh, you know, if there is something they don't expect, they would just exit early, which is already quite good, right? So there is some bit of error handling here. Um, yeah, there is this here. I'm, I'm not sure what this is checking, to be honest, uh, and a bunch of other things. Um, let's skip through a bit more. Uh, because I want to get to the main part of the function. Um, now th there is a few things happening here. I, I figured that you know uh, some some of these um, so, some of these uh, uh, bytes in the uh, bitmap header actually represent the size, and uh, you know they would just um, be calculated somehow. So you'd have the width and the height. Uh, I think they came from. Uh, yeah, they started as zero here, and they were calculated in some other function or something. I'm not too sure. It might also that Ghidra is not pretty, uh, you know, perfect here. So yeah, if you if you look at this here, this is where they are using a reference to the width. So it might be that it's actually written out here. I'm not sure where the height was uh, actually obtained. Yeah, so it was set to zero here, and then, you know, I, I'm I'm not actually seeing anything. Anyway, nevertheless, I, I assume that it's um, now the, uh, well, at least some buffer or something, whatever. So yeah, the, you know, this is typical, like, you know, you would need to allocate some memory in order to write into it and so on. Anyway, so yeah, looking a bit further, uh, th there is this interesting part here, you know, where uh, they're actually looking at the uh, bits per pixel. So there is also value in the uh, bitmap image header, you know, where uh, they would say this is like, a monochrome image, for example, which is just one bit per pixel, right? It can either be set or not set. So it would be like, depending on <laughs> what color you render, like if you do black and white image, you know, th those will be the black pixels usually, and then otherwise they would just be white or vice versa. Um, that really just then depends on the viewer, essentially. Um, then there is like uh, this one here. So you could, could have four bits per pixel. So two to the four would be 16 colors, right? So you would get this handling here. And then you would need to start like you know shifting around and stuff like that. Um, yeah, similar uh, when you go with uh, eight bits per pixel, you would have two hundred and fifty six colors. You would again be shifting around a bit. Similar with uh, you know twenty four or you know hex eighteen colors. Uh, then still you would need to shift around a bit. And if you have thirty two bits per color. You know, you, you can just uh, copy things over directly essentially. So that is sort of what is happening here. Um, yeah, I, I haven't really uh, understood this uh, fully, but yeah, you know, I've got a basic idea and I hope you also get the same similar different, you know, basic idea here now. Um, here in the end, uh, I uh, called these two variables here like other buff and buff, like, you know, these are some sort of buffers and they're being uh, passed to something here, uh, which is assumed to be some function, right? So. Yeah, I guess this here is like, you know, some, some function like, uh, hey, display the image now, and here is the buffer or something. Yeah, that, that is probably coming from somewhere else. Um, again, yeah, this year, if, if we look at this here, 
Uh, it actually starts with zero. So uh, this is 3b28, 3b28 is here. That is all zero. And now if we um, add the uh, hex 48 to it, uh, we would be at 3b70, right? And 3b70 down here. Uh, that is also just zero. So yeah, zero, 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 whatever. Um, yeah, I put this here, malloc question mark, because I think this is uh, where the malloc, uh, like the memory allocation function would be registered. Yeah, anyway, yeah, all of these here are being referenced at some point uh, or, you know, using like these calculations. So yeah, anyway, so now we have a bit of an idea how this here works. So now the thing is, um, what, what happens when we play with the image dimensions here? So we choose a different width and height than, you know, the actual width and height. So uh, what I did was I uh, took the uh, logo fail uh, logo again, you know, I converted that and uh, let me quickly show that to you. So um, yeah, we get these files here. So I converted to a few different sizes until, you know, I had something which was actually small enough for the former. So yeah, there is now the 120 bit uh, pixel size file. So let's have a look at that file, logo file 122.bmp. So yeah, it's really just the uh, logo file logo here. Um, we, we can zoom in a bit, you know, it's just a very low resolution file. So <laughs> yeah, 120 by 120 is like the small. Um, and you might notice if you look very closely, uh, there is actually something hidden down here. Uh, you, you see the slightly green glow maybe, or maybe not. Let me zoom in a bit more. Uh, it's right here in the corner. So yeah, I'll, I will reveal that secret in a bit because it's actually not in the original. And I will now show you another file um, this one here, logo file 120 manip.bmp, that is a manipulated copy. And that looks a bit smaller, but it's still the same file size, right? So what I just did was I, you know, just chose the hex editor tool again that we used last time and just uh, changed the image dimensions. So uh, let me show that to you. Hex editor, uh, logo file 120, 120 manip.bmp. So you, you see, it's it's very really hard to read. I'm very sorry about that. Anyway, so uh, we, we recognize a few things here. So first up, the two bytes here, BM. So that is literally what they are searching for, you know, and then there is a, a bunch of values here. And now to make sense of those values, we would actually need to know the format. I can already tell you that like this is the width and this here is the height. And how do we figure that out? Well, uh, the internet to the rescue again, you know, I just look at Wikipedia here. So in Wikipedia, somebody documented the uh, format of a bitmap. So yeah, we, we see this here. There's the signature. This is two bytes. So one row here would be four bytes. So this is a half row. This is the BM. Then comes the file size. So let's have a look at that. The file size here is, now we need to read backwards again because it's like endianness, you know. So zero, zero, E18A. E18A, that's... Uh, have a look at that in the calculator. Uh, e U one eight A is five seven seven three eight, right? So yeah, that is the file size that we indeed saw, right? So that's uh, ls ls l five seven seven thirty eight. All right, that is uh, already looking good. So now comes this part here. These four bytes are well reserved, reserved. So yeah, whatever, we can just ignore them. Now comes the offset to the pixel array, which is this here. And this is, well, just 8a. So 8a, what is 8a? 8a is just 138. Uh, but because we, we have the markings here, we can actually look at that here. So if we follow to that position 8a, that would be here. So this here is the first byte in, in, in this row, the 10th one, but this is the first byte that is an actual pixel. And that is what got us the green glow. So this pixel here is, um, you know, just created by, you know, me editing the file. And uh, what I did was, well, I just put my name in it, right? So yeah, you, you can see my nickname again here. I, I put Saravolt here. Well, it's uh, 
ending in the second row, but you know, whatever. So yeah, this is uh, how I went by and you know, now I put that file also on my USB drive again. So yeah, let's now actually use the vendor tool and you know, put that uh, file here in the uh, flash. So what I will first do is fs0 colon, right? So this will, you know, enable me to actually execute things. Now we say shell flash .efi, uh, we say dash logo, uh, we go with logo fail one one twenty minip dot bmp, and uh, we need to say dash patch. Well, I can actually show you what happens if you don't say dash patch. It will say, uh, you know, either those, those must be specified. So you don't see the dash here, right? So they would just say patch and file. So I also <laughs> had to figure out that, uh, well, we actually need to say dash all the time. So yeah, this takes a few seconds now. It's uh, writing to the flash. Um, and then we'll just restart the machine. So yeah, we will see that now in a few seconds. So it's rebooting and we're seeing our new logo. And as you can see, there is actually not much, right? So it was really just a few pixels remaining. And now that is uh, depending on the uh, specifics of the image parser, you know, what that looks like. Um, you also get this message here where it says, you know, you can create the startup.nsh file. If you have one, then, you know, it would just be, uh, be automatically executed. So in other words, you could actually, um, you know, prepare a USB drive, uh, which has the vendor tool, you know, the EFI file. Um, you, you could just boot from it. You can prepare a startup.nsh file and, you know, just have it automatically write your own logo onto uh, the flash which means, you know, you can also give that to other people. So you might be a bit uh, careful with uh, random USB drives that you get. Um, so what we now did was we actually wrote a broken bitmap file, right? So what does that mean? Um, well, the bitmap was probably parsed. Maybe something ended up somewhere in memory and we are going to figure that out in a bit. Um, but before we go ahead, uh, let's have another look again at what binary are writing. So uh, in the slides here, um, you know, co continuing from this year, we, we just did that, right? So we just um, changed the image dimensions and so on. Um, they're saying they could actually trigger some overflows here and there. Uh, like here in this case, this is a JPEG parser where, uh, you know, they could trigger it. Um, yeah, so yeah, the takeaways were, uh, you know, there are a bunch of crashes. So yeah, if you download some images from the internet, uh, you know, just random ones, you, then some parsers might even just crash. I actually found that also uh, in uh, some other blog posts that I read first where somebody was saying, hey, uh, you know, you can create your own logo and write it, but uh, you get to be a bit careful because, you know, certain files might actually break your machine. In our case, it doesn't really matter because we have a backup, right? So as you recall last time and also the time before, uh, we actually read out the spy flash. So yeah, maybe that is also good motivation for you to take a backup of your spy flash today. Anyway, so yeah, they looked at some like other parsers and so on and then came up uh, with a proof of concept. So what they did was, you know, they got a thing center, also a product from Lenovo. It's like, you know, these small boxes, which are essentially desktop machines. Oh, I'm, I'm very sorry. So, okay, we need to step back again because I just realized that you've been looking at my other screen again all the time. I'm very sorry. Okay, let's go back again. Uh, we were here, um, pixel height, pixel width. So yeah, we played around with that. Um, yeah, they also played around with a few things and found some corruptions here and there you know, and um, then went ahead and uh, created the proof of concept with this machine. We just have a different one. We, we have this X270 laptop. Okay, so uh, in, in, in this case here, uh, you know, they selected a PNG image uh, as their, you know, um, <laughs> target. Uh, it's a somewhat simple format. Um, yeah, they're using AMI firmware here on, on this machine. So yeah, Lenovo, you know, this uh, has some different partnerships for, uh, you know, these and those things. So yeah, on our machine, as I said, we got Phoenix homework. So what they did was here now, uh, they created a PNG file, you know, which had something in it 
uh, that that they would control. So what they did was, um, you know, uh, they they are marking here like uh, the there are these IDAT chunks that is something specific to PNG. I'm not sure what IDAT is short for or uh, you know the other ones. Like there is HDR here, I guess that is a header, and then this here is probably data, right? So like image header, image data. That's probably it. And uh, well, they chose something to, so that in the output buffer, you know, when you uh, interpret those uh, bytes here, you would actually get like, um, you know, the short version of that company name, BRLY for binary. So yeah, I did something uh, similar and we will look at that in a bit. Anyway, so they found some integer overflow here, you know, uh, or with the image dimensions here, uh, they could get to this point where, you know, if you multiply this uh, quite large number by two, you would actually end up be with 80, you know, because, um, you know, eight by two is then 16, but you don't get that extra digit here because it's just 32 bits, right? So if you overflow the th 32 bits, uh, you, you would end up with 80 again, because like that is just two times 40. So um, we might actually be able to do something similar, uh, but yeah, that is not what I've tried yet. I just, you know, chose some very, very small dimensions. And um, yeah, I want to show you something a bit as well. So yeah, um, what, uh, now they um, said, well, how, how does that even work now? How you can, how can you exploit this? And, uh, you know, how do you actually uh, realize that uh, you managed to corrupt some memory or something? So the um, older Intel machines, they had something that is called DCI. You could use a USB cable, you know, essentially to have a debug console. Um, that isn't working on the newer CPU models. Uh, there is something called BootGuard now, which is, you know, active in like most uh, Lenovo machines from what I found, uh, like the Intel based ones. So that prevents you from placing your own stuff in the firmware. So you cannot just execute something for monitoring. So uh, you will need something else. Um, well, they couldn't even get something when it crashed, right? So yeah, they're now talking a bit about the heap, how it works with um, EFI or, well, this is, I guess, um, based on something in EDK2, maybe, I don't know. Um, anyway, so uh, roughly uh, there is like a pool allocator, it, you know, would get you some memory here and there. Um, I'm not exactly sure about the details here, but yeah, it really also doesn't really matter for us right now. Uh, let's let's skip through a bit here. Um, they're looking at this here. Uh, what are we even corrupting, right? So you you could have some output buffer at some point where you end up with something, and then uh, you know the question is, could you also write into other chunks and so on? Actually, it's uh, it's it's really hard to tell. So, but but you might be lucky. So the memory that is allocated by the UFI firmware might actually still exist when your operating system is running. Which means when we are in an operating system, we can scan through all the memory and we can see if we find something that is left from the firmware. So yeah, let's let's see if we can, uh, you know, if we can find the output buffer actually. We don't know what the buffer is because, you know, that is, um, that is never being uh, provided by the firmware. There is like no, um, you know, there, there is no like text output where it would say, hey, this is now the output buffer where I'm writing this image and so on, right? We, we just see a few pixels, uh, you know, uh, on the screen, which are the boot logo and that's it. So yeah, what they did was they actually also scanned the um, memory here just uh, like I did with, you know, just uh, to prepare this here. And yeah, let's uh, actually have a look at that in a bit. So yeah, they managed to find something. And now look at this here, look very closely. So there is something called PTAL, PHD0, HISP here, and so on. And then they have some data in between. Um, yeah, this, this is not the object they could corrupt. Um, yeah, so yeah, you, you need to figure something out. Um, but let's actually see if we can already get to a similar point here. And with that, um, Let's uh, look at the HMI capture again and uh, this year. So yeah, we, we just rebooted, right? So we now wrote a manipulated uh, logo to the flash and you know, we just saw those uh, few pixels remaining. 
And now let's see that we start a Linux kernel. So uh, we will go FS0 again and run the BZ image thing here. So BZ image is just the name of the Linux kernel here. Um, we're just going to run that. So yeah, we uh, get our friendly uh, penguins up here. Um, we, we can type commands and so on. And I'm going I'm now going to mount something. So, you know, uh, the USB drive here has a second partition, which is actually a Linux partition. Uh, I have it here, SDA2, and let's mount that on T, Z, C, Z, whatever. It doesn't really matter what it's called. Um, I need to prepare a bit uh, more. So I have these files, uh, which are SO files. So these are like shared object files. Uh, they need to be in specific places. Um, so I will just copy them twice, once to lib64 and once to user lib. So these are the ones that I linked a uh, tool against, which is now uh, capable of, you know, finding something in memory. So we're going to do the following. Um, you, you might know this device in, in Linux, which is the dev mem device, right? So the dev mem device gives you access to all the physical memory. You know, you could even do memory mapped IO through that. Technically, uh, it always depends a bit on the specific platform and so on. And uh, we're going to scan this memory for something, you know, that is a, a pattern that I wrote to the uh, image, um, like th that I wrote in the image, so in the bitmap file. Um, let us maybe go back again to my other screen here and uh, let's actually look at the tool that I made and, you know, the image file again. So, yeah, you know, I put my nickname in here. I, I put a bunch of other things like xxxxx, uh, a little message from our hackerspace here. And then, you know, when you scroll down, you know, I put some other xxx here. I said, finally, is doing cool research, <laughs> a smiley face, you know, stuff like that. Um, anyway, so yeah, let's exit that file um, and have a look at something that I created here, which I just called find me. So yeah, I just wrote a tool in Rust, which is, uh, you know, not doing much. So you can provide a few arguments. Uh, you can give it a file, an offset, a limit and a step size. So the file will be the dev mem file, right? So we're looking at the dev mem file. And we're going to see if we can find something in it. We can give an offset, offset to start from. We can give a limit that is like actually the uh, maximum of uh, bytes to scan. And then the step size, which is like, you know, you can go in steps of like one byte at a time or two or four or 16 or whatever you want. We're going to uh, look for those things here. My nickname again, uh, you know, just with a different engine uh, it might be that we might find this here. Um, I put Kabilek in here because that is something that I just found randomly uh, when I looked at memory by hand a bit. And the XXXXXX, because, you know, that is also very easy to match on. I just, you know, put so put so many X's in there. That is uh, a really uh, th something that we should find, like, you know, regardless of, uh, like, the step size, we could go with, like, I don't know, 16 bytes at a time. Anyway, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's literally doing uh, nothing more than just opening the file seeking through the file and then seeing if uh, you know that there is some match here and if if so then no it would just print something we, we could that uh, write that in a bit more elegant way in rust but yeah whatever it doesn't really matter it's it's really just a, a tool for us right so yeah um with that tool now uh let's actually scan through memory but um we are not just going to do that blindly instead we're going to use um this little note down here. So I figured that at this address here, like, you know, around uh, hex B and then seven zeros, right? Uh, around that uh, spot, you would actually find something uh, left over from the UFI former. So let's uh, run that now on the actual device. So we're going to say, uh, find me, uh, sorry, uh, T C Z find me, right? So yeah, here we uh, we can look at the uh, help. Like that is essentially what I just showed you. So we're going to say dash f for the file that is dev mem, uh, dev mem. Uh, we're going to say um, dash s for the step size, and let's just choose sixteen bytes at a time. Uh, we're going to use the offset that I just told you, hex b 
and then seven zeros, one, two, three, four more. Uh, and then we're going to use a limit of, well, just one and then seven zeros, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And because we want to note down the findings, we will just write that to uh, slash tmp slash findings. So yeah, um, this now takes a short while to run. Uh, it's not too long, but you know, at, at some point we should get some results. So yeah, it should find us something which is matching the xxxx or uh, or maybe not. Uh oh, did I did I mess that up? It looks like it. Um. That's that's more TMP findings. Oh yeah, look, yeah. Um, I don't know what I did there. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's how I used the T command. Uh, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, yeah. Let's let's scroll through this here. So we found a bunch of X's. Did we also find my nickname? I think I just saw it down there. Uh, yeah. Let me just scroll through. Uh, we we can grab for it, right? So we can grab for a C in uh tmp findings uh that is uh that is not in there but did we did we find something else did we find the cabby lake right so we found the cabby lake thing in there um we might want to choose some some other step size maybe maybe a step size of uh let's say eight um Right, right. Okay, so yeah, I used the T command wrong. So you just say T and then the file name, and then you would still get something on standard out. So yeah, there is Cabby Lake, there is a bunch of X's, and uh, another Cabby Lake again. Wow, interesting. Yeah, as you can see, it's actually finding a bunch of things. Oh, look, and there is my nickname. And do we get something else? Yeah, we might. So you see there is lots of X's. Now the thing is I also found some false positives and the false positives are uh, you know, a, a bit of a mess. Now the question is how do we actually look at that memory now? So we, we, we have those findings but we actually want to look at the memory around it. So you know, I, I will just uh, choose something simple. So I will use the dd command to um, you know, now read from the devmem device and we will just run it through hex dump and you know put it somewhere again in the temp directory and then we can walk through it a bit. So um, yeah, but let me uh, let me grab for let me grab for my nickname again in the uh, findings and let's see. That is around that address B9FA75AF8. And let me let me just note that down um, in the notes. So yeah, um, you're not seeing that right now, but it doesn't really matter. I, I just want to note down the address so that we can remember it for, uh, you know, later. B9FA75F8. So yeah, I, I will just write that this is where we found my nickname. Alrighty. Uh, and with that, uh, let us say dd. So we'll now say dd if the input file is slash dev slash mem. Uh, we will choose a block size, which is like fairly large. Uh, we will say 4096. So that is a 4K size. And, um, you know, if, if you know that uh, 4096 in decimal is actually hex 1000. So it is a very convenient thing. That means we can just omit the last three digits now from uh, you know the output that we saw here. So uh, we, we can just say skip equals. Now we can go hex uh, B9FA7, right? Now we can give it a count. I will go with um, like I don't know, 10. That would be enough, I think. And then, uh, you know, uh, I mean, one would even be enough, but yeah, whatever. Uh, we're going to write that to slash tmp slash xxx, maybe. And well, let's now do the following. So in, instead of seven, let's actually go with, um, let's, let's go with four. So, you know, we, we get something before and after it. Okay. So 
Uh, but um, I would like to do something. Uh, I would like to uh, go with the hex dump, right? So that we can actually look at the hex dump. And let's see at uh, TMP triple X. So let's now walk through that. And what we see is, well, there is actually quite a bunch of stuff in there. Um, maybe things we did not expect. I, I don't even know what is in there. But yeah, what, what do we find here? There is this stuff. Uh, let, let's look at the fourth row, for example. There is something called P -A -T, uh, PTAL. Uh, and then there it, it says like or uh, alignment. Uh, I guess that could have been alignment at some point. Uh, there is something like reserved P memory, you know, a, a bunch of strings. So in, in the EFI world, um, there is like 16 bits per uh per character as it seems right so there is always a zero by um yeah it, it says something about uh a bridge uh memory you know all, all of that stuff here so yeah let's uh, scroll through a bit more uh next page next page next page ooh there is a bunch of x's but those are lowercase x's so that is not what we wrote um we wrote uppercase x's but again there is a, bu a bunch of stuff there is like, you know, half words and stuff like that. Um, there it says ThinkPad. Uh, do we actually get to the point where we see my name? Um, yeah, we, you know, we took a bit like before and after it. So yeah, we would need to scroll a bit more. Um, but you, you see, this is already similar to what we saw on the slide. Uh, and now let's, uh, I, I think we need to go to like 4,000 something in order to see my nickname now. Uh, let's scroll a bit more. Oh, look, there we have something already. So we see a bunch of X's and we see something that looks similar to my nickname. There's just CYR and then VOL. So uh, that is as if it were treated like, you know, just, um, just like, uh, for, uh, like 24 bit value. So it's like, you know, part of it was discarded. So that might have been part of the image parser and, you know, copying things around actually. Um, so that is already very interesting, right? So let's scroll a bit further and here we got the, um, sort of the same thing, uh, but now it's uh, my full nickname again. So yeah, now we, uh, we, we see some leftovers from what the, you know, image parser and the firmware actually did there. Interesting stuff, uh, again, uh, there is see something um, up there again, right? So yeah, we actually managed to, you know, in, indeed have something left here. So now the question is, um, can we actually trigger something uh, that leads us to an exploit with this? So yeah, uh, let us look again at the uh, slides here. So, you know, uh, how, how did they proceed? So they wanted to write behind the output buffer, right? So this here. And the question is, how, how do you get to this point? So yeah, that, that is something uh, I haven't really uh, tried yet, right? So I, I just wanted to see if I can find something in memory that I, you know, chose to put in there. Um, but yeah, anyway, if, if we get to this point, then uh, indeed uh, <laughs> we would have successfully corrupted something. Um, so yeah, let's let's see if uh, by crafting a, a bit of a different image, uh, we we can actually get to this point. So uh, let's uh, let's use our hex editor again, and let's hex editor our logo again. And instead of writing something very small and tiny, uh, like like we did here, uh, let us write something large. So uh, that would be, hang on. Um, those those four bytes, right? So how about we, uh, I don't know, put an F here, or maybe here. That should already be uh, like big enough for us. So we put an F here and we put an F here, right? So if, if we do this, um, well, what, what happens if we try to open this now in the uh, geeky image viewer? It might actually crash, well, it, Actually, you said, well, this is, uh, we, we cannot display this, right? Okay, so that is very interesting. Um, just for verification, so if, if we revert this back, if we put a zero again here, 
and here you know uh let, let's see what happens when we um oh i huh, I, I think this might actually okay let's let's check the bmp header again because i'm getting a bit unsure here okay so uh we we get this here the header size header size was uh this this here okay so those four bytes were indeed for uh the image size okay so let, let's let's do something a bit different let's put a one here right so yeah something that doesn't exceed too much uh and here save it and let's see if we can now open it again oh look now we get a stretched view of the image um it's saying it's 264 by 264 but it actually doesn't really look like it you know this is like uh there is apparently something missing here. So yeah, that is because uh, we chose those values. So this here would be um, 0108. Uh, we can look at that in the hex editor. So 108 would be indeed 264, right? So yeah, but we're uh, actually lying here. So yeah, let's uh, let's go with a slightly larger number. Let's say, I don't know, uh, 608. 608 sounds very interesting. Uh, and same here, no, 6, 6, oh, 8. So yeah, hex 608, that would be 1,544. So we would have like more than a megapixel. That might actually already be a, a bit much because that would be like more than a megabyte or something. Um, but anyway, uh, let us let us actually try that. So what I will now do is I will shut down the machine again uh you're not seeing that right now but yeah whatever i'm just saying power off um so i'm getting back the usb drive here now we will uh, mount the usb drive and uh put the newly edited image on it so we will we will mount that uh sda1 that's it and uh then we copy the logo fail 120 manip bmp file to mnt and human and sudo human uh, there we go all right wait a few seconds and unplug the usb drive Alrighty, so uh, back again. Let us see what happens now. Uh, let's turn on the machine again. Uh, let us, you know, flash the newly created uh, image file there. Uh, we say fs0, we say shell flash, we say dash logo, logo fail one, one. I uh, could actually delete a bunch of these, uh, you know, all the files that I played with. So you could see, you know, I also had like 160 pixels, 150 pixels, uh, you know, but they were actually too large, so I couldn't really use them. So yeah, uh, let's see. We might actually just uh, break the machine for now. Um, if that happens, you know, we just uh, re restore it from the backup that we had. Uh-oh. Did that look like a broken image to you? When I see that again, let's uh, let's restart. Let's uh, let's see again what happened. It was actually quite funny. Uh, oh, look at that! It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Okay, um, I've actually never tried that before, as I told you. So that was even a, pr a surprise for me. So we're looking at BZ image now again, and we are going to uh, do the same thing as before. We're going to mount the second partition to slash TCZ. Uh, we're going to copy the TCZ. Uh, it should actually uh, pro provide a better USB drive or something. Uh, work on that a bit. Anyway, um, we need the SO files in lib64 and also in user lib and then we can say tcz and find me and find me gets the file dev mem it gets the uh 
dash s for for the uh, you know the step size, and then we get the offset, which is hex b o o o one two three four, and then the uh, limit that is hex one one two three four five six seven. All right, and uh, let's see what we get. Oh, let's actually uh, do the same thing as before, and uh, you know. Um, T that to slash TMP slash find findings like this. All right, so we're going to see a, you know a bunch of these X's appear, and I hope we're also going to see my nickname again because uh, yeah, we might or we should. Oh look, there it is, right? Okay, so yeah, it's it's still running. It's still running. It's almost done. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so let's uh, grab for see if just that is sufficient uh, in TMP findings. Findings. Okay, we we found it once and we found it at this address now. Mm, let me quickly um, compare that to my notes. So this is now B9E708F8 and before it was like B9FA. 75 f8 so yeah some 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 similar thing here um anyway but uh we want to see what is around that right so uh we're again going to dd we say the input file is uh def mem the block size is 4096 we choose a count of 10 and uh we're going to use an offset um What's it again in uh, DD? Yeah, we're going to say skip and then we say hex. Uh, what is it? OX B9 E7 O. But instead of 7 O, we're going to go with um, 6 uh, C. And then we're going to hex dump that and write it into. Uh, TMP XXX again. All right, so in uh, TMP XXX, uh, we, uh, you know, as usual, we just uh, find a bunch of stuff. Uh, we're going to scroll down to my nickname and let's see if we, you know, get something funny around it actually. So, yeah, as you can see, there is uh, once again a bunch of things. Um, I think I actually just scrolled past it. Damn it. Yeah, uh, let's uh, let's actually do the following. So uh, we can also just uh, grab for my nickname in there now, right? So we can say grab C Y R like this. Um, we we find it like uh, in in one occurrence, right? So that is uh, around the position four eight F zero. So yeah, let's uh, let's see again that we find that position four eight something. Four, 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 eight something. Okay, uh, I'm I'm not seeing it yet. There. Oh, and look, there is actually our message. Uh, Chaospot say uh, says hello. UFI is awesome. We love ACPI. Yeah, I mean it's it's just for uh you know shits and giggles as you say. Um, but yeah, we uh did indeed uh find our uh, stuff again here. Um. Do we find other stuff that is funny that we wrote in here? I don't know. Um, did we actually manage to write into uh, something that um, we should not have? Oh, look, there is like logo FA something BMP. Uh, so apparently the um, file name is partially stored in there. I don't know. It's, uh, it's not complete anyway. Um, oh, look down there. There is actually logo fail 120 manip.bmp. Oh, right. Ah, that might actually be a listing from the USB drive. I'm not even sure. Could be. It could be. Yeah. There is also something about PEIM, PEI modules, like pre EFI something. Um, interesting. Yeah. Do, do, do we find something uh, from the other strings like 
Oh no. No. We, we didn't find the statement by uh, like the binary statement we wrote. That is very sad. But well, we, we managed to find the chaos bot reference. Um, in, in part at least. Yeah, grip is not the best tool here, um, but yeah, whatever. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, so with that, uh, let's try the following. So I would like to uh, reboot. I would like to see if we manage to corrupt something that would then appear, uh, you know, in the firmware menu. So let's see what happens when we press F1 to enter the menu. So it says entering the setup. Uh, do, do we see funny stuff in here? Well, we don't. It actually looks quite okay, right? So it looks like just as usual. So not, nothing special in here. Um, yeah, but um, we, we did manage to, um, you know, get, get some junk into the uh, splash screen already. Okay, let's just, just for the fun of it, have a look at it again. Um, it's, it's somewhat hilarious because it looks like there is, uh, I, I really don't know what happened there actually, to be honest. Um, but yeah, we uh, did manage to write a large buffer. So, okay, let's do the following. Um, if we, uh, if, we, if we try the same trick that binary did, what happens? So should we, should we just use the same image dimensions like, uh, two by, you know, whatever that large value was. So let's see, uh, we will go with, um, was it eight, right? Eight something, 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 40, four, zero, zero. So that would be this year. And then here we would just go with um, two, right? So in a 32-bit world, that would be an overflow. And uh, well, if we look at Ghidra, is that actually a 32-bit value that is being used here for uh, the image dimensions? Because from what I saw, I thought it was actually, uh, right, so it's it's uint for the height. So from, from I think that might be the height. Uh, there was a long, long for the width. Uh, another long, long for some offset. Uh, do we have the width? Yeah, there, undefined eight. So yeah, I don't even know the data type here. Um, but, uh, you know what we can do, we can find occurrences of width here, right? So this here, like, uh, this function is doing something with it. Um, it, it's really hard to tell what is exactly is happening here. Um, oh, well. So yeah, I, I put the width underscore L here because that would be like the lower bits, right? So if you end with a mass, then you would only keep the uh, one bits, well, the bits like behind this here. So everything higher would be discarded. Um, do we find something else where width is used uh, here? Where I'm, uh, I'm sure this is like, um, you know, it, it could happen that this year already uh, triggered some uh, overflow in here before it's being cast to a long long. Could be. We, we will figure that out. So yeah, anyway, um, let's, let's, let's just try that. Let's uh, write this here to the uh, BMP file. Uh, put that on the USB drive again and write it to flash and see what happens. So, um, well, if we're unlucky, it might just allocate tons of memory and just I don't know, uh, sudo cp sudo umon and humon. All right. So back again on the laptop, which is just hilarious, but yeah, whatever. 
So we say fs0 colon, we say shell something, we say dash logo, logo fail, logo fail, 120manip.bmp and dash patch. Yeah, I'm, I'm very much used to this now. We might actually uh, do a small like tutorial recording with this so you know that you can also just prepare your own uh, USB drive and so on. I, c I could grow, uh, like walk through the full steps and so on, right? Okay, let's see if the machine still boots and if we see something. Uh, it actually looks like a, just a cursor. I think we just broke something. Yep, that looks like a whoopsie. We just broke something. So yeah, this is uh, where uh, we would need to restore it from our backups. That is why we took the backups. Now let me just um, unplug the USB drive and, uh, you know, just uh, reboot again. Let's just see what happens when I force shut down it and so on. I'm just uh, pressing the power button here for a few seconds. I guess it's like 10 seconds and then would we force power off. Right now it's off again and let's uh, boot again. No signal detected yet. Okay, there is the signal. And uh, we just uh, see a cursor that isn't blinking. Awesome. So we, you know, just uh, managed to break something here. Um, now maybe we already triggered some overflow or something. Uh, it's a bit hard to tell right now because we, we can't really check on it again. So yeah, uh, I, I guess we should uh, write something else to the flash port again. Um, yeah, but we will do this some other time. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good start now. So we, uh, you know, we have a bit of a setup now and uh, something to work with. Um, we have a bunch of files that we edited. Um, let's ma maybe uh, just uh, recap a bit here. So what we just did was, um, you know, we changed the image dimension in the file. So uh, yeah, here we're uh, claiming that this um, image here would actually be uh, quite large. Well, it's actually not, right? So this here is like 8000400. Oh, that is actually um, not exactly what I wanted here, but yet yeah, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's still quite a large file. So what I wanted is this here. That would be the same thing that Binary did. Um, but yeah, it doesn't really matter, right? Um, yeah, we, we, we can go with that, but yeah, I, I don't think that would work now. Um, anyway, I need, I need to recover back uh, first. So yeah, we um, we are now quite far in uh, what uh, Binary was writing. Um, let, let's see if, uh, you know, we can find something interesting after this part here, you know, that gives us another hint. Uh, this is their recap. So yeah, what they did was like, you know, they triggered some overflow. They, um, you know, apparently uh, managed to flash something that would then still be uh, visible in the operating system and, you know, would actually still be able to boot and so on. So yeah, there is still this uh, step left of getting code execution out of that. And um, well, they, they're saying, well, it's actually not too easy. So uh, for heap exploitation, uh, you would need some very strong primitives. Um, can can you in influence the heap directly? Is something you you would need to you know do some clever crafting with a in, in this case PNG chunks. In our case, that would be like the bitmap parts. Um, yeah, what what they want to do is they want to find something which is this year PRTE protocol entry. And this is uh, where you can indeed gain code execution. So in UFI, you have these protocols and you know, that's like a communication mechanism. Protocols are being called and so on. So they want to write into a section where they can be certain that would actually be called by other code again, right? So we use the image parser, the image parser is writing something to memory, then more code is being executed and that calls into something that is now being left here by the image parser. Uh, yeah, that, that is essentially how it would work. Um, yeah, these um, protocols, yeah, uh, they are also writing that they are a core concept in UEFI. Protocol entry has multiple pointers to objects with function pointers. 
right? So you, you see where this is going. Um, there is like this uh, event system in UFI where you know you, you have these like protocol notify things, I event, and then like callback handlers. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about those details there. I haven't really uh, looked into that too much uh, yet, to be honest. Um, but yeah, th this is also uh, the path that we should try to go. Well, well uh, what they did, then did was um, because, you know, uh, the memory uh, that that is written here is actually uh, mostly executable and, you know, like most from where they found uh, often there is a fixed address. So what, what we just saw was like, um, I, I'm not sure if we actually get fixed addresses. We, we might need to reboot a few times and see if we always get the same stuff at the same position in memory. I, I don't think so from, you know, my early experiments, but, you know, we, we need to see. Um, so what they did was, you know, they stored some shell code there, like UEFI shell code, you know, essentially just like the stuff that we just typed previously. But, you know, they would do something else like, you know, you, you could like disable the secure boot stuff by, you know, running some commands like, you know, you can actually uh, change the memory from a UEFI shell and so on. Um, like there, there is like a, you know some primitives in uh, UEFI that you can use. Um, you can use another payload. Like you know, if you do like uh, from a browser, you would attack something. Like do a drive by download. You put something in the EFI system partition. You put something in the firmware itself. You know, and then um, you would from the firmware call into something on your EFI system partition. You know to like have a larger binary that you know can then do very very rich stuff like you know. Um, I don't know, create some other files maybe that would uh, then manipulate the operating system. Uh, or, you know, if you have, um, like, I don't know, if, if you want to gather some data, you could just be running some, uh, some daemon in the background or uh, a system service or whatever you want to call it. And then, you know, just um, uh, send the data to somewhere on, you know, some uh, web server or something. You know, th there is a lot of creativity. Or you can go like ways like you know um, uh, I don't I don't know you can uh, like you know there is like um, these um, tools now which uh, you know would just uh, lock your machine forever and un unless you pay a ransom or you know stuff like that um, that is up to uh, an, an attacker's creativity so we just want to prevent that from happening right so that's why we do this uh, research we verify these findings so that we can actually prevent those issues. Um, anyway, yeah, um, we will not be able to cover uh, more of this this year now because, um, you know, uh, next week I will be at the Chaos Communication Congress and uh, we will actually uh, have an assembly there with the uh, open source uh, firmware assembly. Um, let's, uh, let's quickly look at the, uh, do we have that here? Right. Um, so yeah, if you uh, if you want to find me, if you by coincidence actually uh, saw this recording here or the stream, uh, I'm I'm not sure. Uh, you can come by here. Um, I'm not sure yet where we will be found. I guess uh, we will <laughs> figure that out here. Um, yeah, Zaolin, a, a friend of mine, um, is our main contact here. But you can also find me at the assembly. There are no projects or e other events that we have submitted yet. Um, yeah, but we you know we might give some uh, sessions. Maybe I will run a bit of a like um, you know firmware exploitation workshop or something like that, um, you know, or something constructive where you know I would actually teach some some things like you know about the Orbit project and so on. Anyway, um, yeah, with that, uh, thank you very very much for uh, listening in again today and uh, following along, and um, yeah, take care until next time. Goodbye.